ever stumbled upon terms like accruals or depreciation or goodwill and wondered what they really mean, or maybe you've been confused by different accounting words that seem to say the same thing. Are you stuck memorizing accounting terms without really understanding them? Well, you're not alone. Hi there. If you're new here, my name is Joe and I make videos that help to simplify complex topics like accounting, economics, statistics, finance and other related fields and make them accessible to everyone. My goal is to supplement your learning process whether you're a student, a professional or just someone who wants to be more financially literate. So if you're ready to ditch the flashcards and truly grasp the concepts behind accounting, economics and more, you're in the right place. Stick around and let's learn together. In this video, we'll focus on some of the most confusing terms and concepts in financial accounting so you can finally make sense of it all. Let's get started. All right, let's dive right into the heart of the income statement, the first line. Now this is where things can get a bit tricky because there are a few different terms that essentially mean the same thing. You might hear it called revenue, sales or even turnover. But guess what? They all refer to the same thing, which is the total amount of money a company earns from its core business activities, usually from selling goods or services. And here's another term you might encounter, the top line. This is just another way to refer to revenue because it sits right at the top of the income statement. For example, for a bakery, the top line would be the total money earned from selling bread, cakes and pastries. Now, let's move down to the other end of the income statement. This is where we see the results of all the company's operations after all expenses and taxes have been deducted from the top line revenue. Again, we have a few different terms that essentially mean the same thing here. You might hear it called profit, net income, earnings, or even margin sometimes. Think of it as what's left over after all the bills are paid. It's the company's take home pay, so to speak. And just like with revenue, there's another term you'll often hear, the bottom line. This simply refers to net income because it's located at the very bottom of the income statement. This should also help you answer why the statement is known as the profit and loss statement or an income statement. Okay, we just learned that earnings is another word for net income or the bottom line of the income statement. But the term earnings doesn't stop there. It pops up in a bunch of other important accounting terms and in this slide we're going to explore a few of them. First up, we have EBITDA which stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation and amortization. So it quite literally is the profit before deducting your interest, taxes, depreciation and amortization. It's a way to measure a company's operating performance without the impact of financing and accounting decisions. Then there's EBIT or earnings before interest and taxes. Okay, so again, it's quite literally the profit generated before deducting the interest and taxes. It's similar to EBITDA, but it includes depreciation and amortization expenses. It gives a clearer picture of a company's operating profitability. Next, we have retained earnings. This represents the portion of a company's net income that has been reinvested back into the business rather than being distributed to shareholders as dividends. So retained earnings quite literally means the earnings that have been retained by the company and not distributed to the shareholders. Finally, there's PE ratio or price to earnings ratio. This compares a company's stock price to its earnings per share. It's a way to measure how much investors are willing to pay for each dollar of the company's earnings. Earnings per share or EPS is calculated by dividing the company's net income by the number of outstanding shares of its common stock. A high P to E ratio might suggest that investors expect strong future growth while a low P to E ratio could indicate that the company is undervalued. Now that we've set the stage, let's tackle one of the most fundamental yet often misunderstood concepts in accounting, debits and credits. These two terms are the backbone of the double entry bookkeeping system, which is how we record every financial transaction. At its core, the double entry system is all about balance. Every transaction has two sides. Something is given and something is received. Debits and credits are simply the way we represent these two sides. Think of it like a seesaw. 
To keep it balanced, every movement on one side needs an equal and opposite movement on the other side. That's how debits and credits work. Now it's important to note that debits and credits in accounting have a slightly different meaning than how we use them in everyday life. You might associate debit with money leaving your bank account and credit with money coming in. But in accounting, it's not that simple. Instead, think of it this way. The source of a benefit is credited and the destination is debited. So when you sell a product, the revenue account, which is the source of the benefit, is credited and the cash or accounts receivable account, which would be the destination of the benefit, is debited. Understanding debits and credits is crucial because it's how we track the flow of money and resources within a business. It allows us to create accurate financial statements and make informed decisions. If you want to explore debits and credits in more detail with plenty of examples to solidify your understanding, be sure to check out my comprehensive video on this topic. You'll find the link for this in the description below. All right, let's get moving and talk about two fundamental accounting methods, cash basis accounting and accrual basis accounting. These methods determine when transactions are recorded in the books and they can significantly impact how a company's financial picture looks. In cash basis accounting, it's all about cash. Revenue is recognized only when cash is received and expenses are recognized only when cash is paid out. Think of it like your own personal finances. You probably track your spending based on when money leaves your bank account, right? That's the basic idea behind cash basis accounting. It's relatively simple to understand and use, which is why it's often favored by small businesses or individuals. On the other hand, accrual basis accounting focuses on when transactions actually occur, regardless of when the cash changes hands. So revenue is recognized when it's earned, that is when the product is delivered or the service is provided, even if the customer hasn't paid yet. And expenses are recognized when they are incurred, even if the bill hasn't been paid yet. This method provides a more accurate picture of a company's financial position at any given point in time, but it's also more complex and requires more sophisticated record keeping. That's why it's generally used by larger businesses and is required for publicly traded companies. Imagine a company sells a product on credit in December but receives payment in January. Under cash basis accounting, the revenue would be recorded in January. But under accrual basis accounting, the revenue would be recorded in December when the sale actually occurred. So in a nutshell, cash basis accounting is about the timing of cash flows while accrual basis accounting is about the timing of economic events. Both methods have their pros and cons and the choice depends on the size and complexity of the business. Now, let's talk about two terms that often cause confusion, receivables and payables. These are essentially two sides of the same coin representing money that's owed to or by a company. Receivables are amounts of money that a company expects to receive in the future from its customers for goods or services that have already been delivered or rendered. Receivables are considered an asset because they represent a future economic benefit to the company. Now you might also come across terms like accounts receivable, trade receivable, or even notes receivable. These are all different types of receivables, but the basic idea is the same, someone owes your company money. On the other hand, payables are amounts of money that a company owes to its suppliers or vendors for goods or services that it has received but hasn't yet paid for. Payables are considered a liability because they represent a future economic outflow from the company. Similar to receivables, there are also terms like accounts payable, trade payable, and notes payable, which are all just different types of payables. So remember, receivables are what others owe to your company, while payables are what your company owes to others. They are both important elements of a company's financial position and can significantly impact its cash flow. Okay, let's now tackle two concepts that can be a bit mind-bending at first, deferrals and accruals. These are all about timing, when we recognize revenue and expenses in our accounting records, even if the cash hasn't changed hands yet. 
Deferrals happen when we receive or pay cash before we've actually earned the revenue or incurred the expense. It's like getting paid in advance for a job you haven't done yet or paying for a year's worth of insurance upfront. In accounting terms, this creates a liability for deferred revenue or an asset for deferred expense on the balance sheet until the revenue is earned or the expense is incurred. Accruals, on the other hand, happen when we've earned revenue or incurred an expense, but we haven't received or paid the cash yet. It's like completing a job, but waiting for the client to pay you or using electricity for a month, but not getting the bill until later. This creates an asset for accrued revenue or a liability for accrued expense on the balance sheet until the cash is received or paid. Remember when we discussed accrual basis accounting a couple of slides back, understanding that should help you not confuse these terms anymore. These four key terms that fall under deferrals and accruals, namely deferred revenue, accrued revenue, deferred expense and accrued expense, I dive deeper into each of these in a separate video so you'll get a full understanding of how they work. You'll find the link to that video in the description below. All right, if you're not completely new to financial accounting, by now you come across assets and liabilities which are usually a bit easier to grasp. But now let's tackle a concept that often is not so clear, equity. What is it and why is it important? In simple terms, equity represents the owner's stake in the business. It's what's left over after you subtract all the liabilities from the assets of the company. Think of it like this, if you sold off all the company's assets and used the money to pay off all its debts, whatever is left belongs to the owners. That's equity. For smaller businesses or sole proprietorships, we often call it owner's equity. It's the owner's personal investment in the business plus any profits the business has earned and kept. For larger publicly traded companies, we call it stockholder's equity. This represents the combined ownership stake of all the shareholders who own the company's stock. Equity grows primarily in two ways. First, when the owners or shareholders invest more money into the business, or when the company is profitable and retains those profits instead of distributing them as dividends. Remember retained earnings from a few slides back? Yes, that's part of equity. So the more profitable a company is and the more of its profits it keeps, the higher its equity will be. This reflects the fact that those profits ultimately belong to the owners. All right, let's now explore two concepts that are closely related but apply to different types of assets, depreciation and amortization. These are both about spreading out the cost of an asset over its useful life, recognizing that assets value diminishes over time. Depreciation applies to tangible assets, things you can touch and feel, like buildings, machinery, vehicles, and even furniture. These assets wear out, become obsolete, or lose value with time. Depreciation is the process of systematically allocating the cost of these tangible assets over their estimated useful lives. It's not about the asset's actual market value, but rather an accounting way to match the expense of the asset with the revenue it helps generate. There are different methods to calculate depreciation like straight line or declining balance, but the core idea is the same, spreading the cost over time. Amortization on the other hand, applies to intangible assets, things you cannot touch like patents, copyrights, trademarks, or even software. These assets also have a limited useful life, either legally or economically. Amortization is the process of systematically allocating the cost of these intangible assets over their useful lives. It's similar to depreciation, but it applies to intangible assets instead of tangible ones. Now the term amortization can also be used when talking about loans like mortgages for example. In this case, an amortization table shows how each loan payment is divided between paying down the principal, which is the original loan amount, and paying the interest. Over time, the portion going towards the principal increases while the interest portion decreases. It's a helpful tool for understanding the breakdown of your loan payments and how much you're actually paying off the loan itself versus just paying interest. All right, let's move on to a concept that's a bit more abstract but incredibly important in the business world, goodwill. 
It's one of those terms that has a meaning in everyday life, but it takes on a specific significance in accounting. In a generic sense, goodwill refers to the positive reputation, brand recognition, customer loyalty, and other intangible factors that contribute to a company's value. It's the feel-good factor that makes a business attractive and successful. Think of it like this. When you choose to buy from a particular store or use a specific brand, it's often because you have a good feeling about them. That's goodwill in action. In accounting, goodwill is a specific type of intangible asset that arises when one company acquires another company for a price that's higher than the fair market value of the acquired company's net identifiable assets. In other words, it's the premium that the buyer is willing to pay for those intangible factors we just talked about. The brand, the customer base, the skilled employees, etc. It's like saying, we're not just buying your buildings and equipment, we're also buying your reputation and potential for future success. So how do we calculate goodwill? It's actually pretty straightforward. Basically, we take the total price the acquiring company paid and we subtract the fair value of all the assets like cash, inventory and equipment minus all the liabilities like debts of the acquired company. Whatever is left over is considered goodwill. Goodwill is a fascinating concept because it tries to put a number on those intangible factors that make a business valuable. While it's not something you can physically touch, it can significantly impact a company's overall worth and its future prospects. All right, let's now talk about the two ways to value a company or its assets, book value and market value. These two terms can sometimes be confused, but they represent very different perspectives on what something is worth. Book value is the value of an asset or a company as it's recorded on the balance sheet. It's based on historical costs and accounting principles and it reflects the original cost of the asset minus any accumulated depreciation or amortization. Think of it as the official value according to the accounting books, hence the name book value. It's what the company paid for the asset adjusted for how much of its value has been used up over time. Book value is useful for tracking the historical cost of assets and understanding the company's financial position from an accounting perspective. Market value, on the other hand, is the price at which an asset or a company could be sold in the open market. It's based on supply and demand, investor sentiment, and future growth potential. Think of it as the real world value, what someone would actually pay for the asset or the company today. Market value is often more relevant for investors and decision makers because it reflects the current market conditions and expectations about the future. So why can book value and market value be so different? Some assets, like land or buildings for example, might appreciate in value over time, making their market value higher than their book value. Intangible assets like brand recognition or intellectual property might not be fully reflected in the book value, but they can significantly boost the market value. Also, investor sentiment and market trends can cause the market value to fluctuate even if the book value remains relatively stable. Well, we've covered a lot in this video exploring some of the most common and confusing terms in financial accounting. Remember, accounting is a language and like any language, it has its own vocabulary and grammar. But once you understand the key terms and concepts, you can start to make sense of the numbers and gain valuable insights into a company's financial health. If you're eager to dive deeper and gain a comprehensive understanding of financial accounting, I invite you to check out my free video course. It's packed with in-depth explanations, practical examples, and valuable insights that will empower you to navigate the complexities of accounting with confidence. You can access this course through my website, joefessa.com, or directly here on YouTube. Whether you're a student, entrepreneur, or simply curious about accounting, this course will help you with the knowledge and skills you need. Thank you for watching. Cheers.